I will and I will share screen. And also, unless you have a question, I just um, have a request. So uh, please stay muted uh, unless you have a question. And then if you have a question, definitely feel free to unmute yourself. All right. So today we will not be really covering a lot of new things. We will just be talking about what Catalyst is and I will just give some basic um, ideas about what we study in Calculus. Uh, can everyone see my screen? All right, good. Um, so our first lesson is what is calculus, right? We will talk about the basics of calculus. Uh, calculus is really about what happens when we slightly change an independent variable. So if you think about from algebra, right? We generally have functions, right? We study functions and that's a big part of algebra. And uh, functions have independent variables and dependent variables. And so calculus is really the study of when you slightly change one of the independent variables, typically your x, what happens to the dependent variable? How does the dependent variable react? Uh, really calculus is the study of infinitely small numbers. So that's sort of the first thing I want you to think about when you think about calculus is the infinitely small numbers and infinitely small changes in variables. And we will also deal a lot with uh, these changes in this course. Uh, and calculus is just very, very useful branch of math. Um, it gives us the tools to find rates of change, which is useful in pretty much any branch of science. Uh, find area and volume, uh, find maximum and minimum points of functions. Uh, we will get into all of that in the course. Really, it's a very exciting branch of mathematics that has a lot of useful applications, not just in math, but in pretty much any other scientific discipline. All right, so first we will get into uh, calculus with a bit of an intro into how it was first developed. So really, when you think of the development of calculus, you think of Isaac Newton, who was a British mathematician physicist, and uh, Leibniz, who was German. And they both discovered um, calculus, formalized it approximately at the same time. And so Newton is most famous, probably, uh, for his study of gravity, right? Newton was the first to observe a gravitational force. Uh, and so Suppose we have this apple, right? And it is falling. And I'm going to replay that. So on the left, we have the apple's position. And generally, when an object on Earth falls, it accelerates. As more time goes on, it falls faster and faster and faster, right? So here we have a graph of distance versus time of the apple where distance is distance fallen and falls right on Newton's head, which is according to legend, how he discovered gravity. And so basically Newton's question was, can we find velocity at any point in time? Like for instance, at time equals seven, what is the apple's velocity, right? And that's actually a very important question, but it's not actually as trivial, right? So. In general, just a quick recap of what velocity is. Velocity is, you can think of it as an object speed, except it also takes into account the object's direction, right? It can be either positive or negative direction, usually associated with moving either forwards or backwards. And so velocity is calculated through distance over time, right? That's speed. And given this formula, right, as we already have distance and time, we should technically be able to calculate velocity. It's actually not so simple, right? Uh, because how do you even define the velocity at a certain point, right? What we can consider the instantaneous velocity of the apple. Um, so generally, we can find the average velocity, right? The average velocity, suppose we have a time t, the average velocity would be the total change in distance that the apple has fallen over that time divided by the amount of time elapsed. So for instance, uh, the average velocity here would be the slope of this line, right? Distance over time. Anyone have any questions so far? All right. 
uh, in that case, uh, so basically that's just average velocity, right? Graphically on this graph, it's distance divided by time. And uh, we can think of that as the slope of this line between the two points. So the slope of the line between two points is the average velocity between these two points. The average velocity isn't exactly accurate, right? Because here the object is moving much slower. Uh, and so this kind of, as we consider like the average velocity between this point and this point, then this point and this point, right? We can think of the velocity at an instant as slope of the line that is tangent to the graph at that point. Uh, and basically how we can think about this is the instantaneous velocity is the average velocity between the black point and a point very, very, very close to it, right? So say we had another point right here, the average velocity between this point and this point would be a much better approximation of the instantaneous velocity than the average velocity between this point and say time zero, right? And so this kind of gives us an intuition for what the average velocity is. This is the slope of the tangent line to this time. So suppose that this line has a slope of two, then uh, the velocity of the falling apple at time t would be two in whatever units that Newton was measuring. And we need calculus to solve this problem, actually. Uh, it seems like a very simple problem, but we actually need uh, calculus because it involves the study of infinitely small distances, right? And uh, we have a term for this. We don't need to know a lot about this term yet, but it's called a derivative. A derivative is just the slope of a tangent line. And so the instantaneous velocity, we usually call that the derivative of distance with respect to time. Again, this is all terminology that we will get more into towards the, um, like later on in the course, but this is just basically a essential problem in calculus. Uh, does anyone have any questions about uh, why calculus is useful in this situation? Um, I was wondering how average velocity is used versus instantaneous velocity. Yeah, so average velocity is the slope of the line between one point in time and another point in time. Uh, instantaneous velocity is uh, basically the same thing, except that other point in time is infinitely close, very, very close, even infinitely close to the other point. So it's just like in, uh, average velocity is an approximation when that point that you are calculating the average velocity with gets closer and closer and closer to the desired point. So uh, the instantaneous velocity is the derivative, while average velocity you can think of it more of as a slope. That's just an uh, approximation of the derivative. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. And as always, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask them. All right. Uh, so how are derivatives used and this concept of uh, instantly changing values, right? Or like uh, very small values. Well, this is used, we saw an application in physics, right? Uh, derivatives are very, very essential in physics because uh, the derivatives describe the relations between basic quantities like time, distance, and so on. And actually, we will also look at, for instance, if you have a function, I'm going to annotate. If you have some sort of graph of a function uh, and we want to find where its maximum and minimum points are, Right, maximum is uh, apparently like uh, just like wherever the function seems largest, and then minimum is wherever the function seems small. So to find this, we actually will need a derivative, but we will get to this later in the course. Uh, but this is actually very very useful in a lot of different uh, mathematical fields. Uh, for example, if you want to maximize profit, minimize expenses, uh, given a general cost or profit function very often you will need calculus, right? And then calculus is also used in all of higher level math. Uh, if you take any course that is, you know, uh, at a university level uh, or even at an advanced high school level, it will require calculus. And this is just like so foundational to all of math and science of this concept of derivatives. All right, so since we just introduced derivatives, um, I mean, again, if you, 
are still a bit unfamiliar or unsure about this, this is fine. Uh, we will go much, much more in depth about this uh, later on in our course. So the other sort of fundamental problem that created calculus um, is the problem of finding an area of a general shape. So consider this circle, right? Uh, what is the area of a circle, by the way, given its radius? Anyone? Oh, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Pi r squared. Um, so that is the area of uh, the circle, right? If we have some sort of radius r, right? Uh, however, we will now like actually prove this. And this is actually a very simple proof, but it does require one thing for which calculus is actually useful and which calculus will help us formalize. So to find this area of a circle, let's divide the circle into tiny, tiny, tiny triangles, right? We will color every other triangle red and all the remaining triangles blue. And again, these aren't really triangles because their bases are curved. These are just very good approximations of triangles as we get more and more and more cuts. So these are really just sectors, but let's refer to them as triangles for now. Uh, so if we stack the sectors or triangles, the red ones, and then stack the blue ones in an alternating way on top of them, what we get is what looks a lot like a parallelogram. It isn't quite a parallelogram, but it does resemble a parallelogram a lot, right? The point is that as we have more and more and more and more sectors, the curvature will become less and less and less meaningful, right? The curvature will more will look more like a straight line, right? And so this resulting shape will look more and more like a parallelogram. Uh, so to find the area of parallelogram, we just do base times height. The base here is half of the circumference because exactly half of the sectors are on top and the other half are on the bottom. So this is pi r. The height is the radius of the circle or r. And again, um, pi here appears because we've defined pi as the ratio of uh, the circumference to two times the radius, right? Pi is by definition this ratio. That's why it appears. It's not just some random constant we came up with out of nowhere. Uh, and so the area is base times height, which is approximately, in this case, pi r squared. And the important thing, again, as I've mentioned, is that if we look here, right, we have the circle and it's being cut into more and more and more and more sectors. And as you see, as the more and more sectors are added, right, the curvature here becomes more and more and more negligible. These little parts right here look more and more like straight lines. We can think of another way to uh, formalize this concept. So we suppose we cut up the circle into say, I think this is 20 sectors. Uh, this circle again has radius R and uh, let the circumference be C. So let's have the length of the curvature of each sector be DC. D in calculus generally represents some sort of change uh, that is infinitely small or very, very like uh, small change. So basically each of these, we can think of each of these lengths of the sector as tiny, tiny changes in the circumference, right? And the circumference is two pi r, right? Two pi times the radius r. And so the area of the circle, we can think about this like this. So how does this area come about? Well, uh, to find the area, we can find the area of each of these individual triangles and then multi triangles or sectors, but as DC gets very, very small, they sort of become triangles and then multiply them by the total number of sectors. So the area of each triangle, we, are, we can approximate this as base times height, right? Base times height is a triangle formula. We can think of this right here as our base. Again, this isn't perfectly straight, but for more and more and more sectors, this does pretty much become straight. And so this is our base and this is our height. And if we divide by two, this is the area of an individual triangle. And then to find the total amount of triangles that there are, well, the total circumference is two pi r, and then the total number of triangles is just two pi r divided by the length that they are subdivided into, right? Uh, if there were 
two triangles, then DC would be pi R. So two pi R over pi R would be two, right? Uh, this makes sense. Uh, anyone have any questions, by the way, about how we calculated any of these values or in general about the process? No? Okay. Uh, again, if anything is unclear at any point, just feel free to uh, stop me and clarify, and I will clarify. All right. Uh, and then this eventually turns out to be pi r squared because the DCs cancel, the twos cancel, r times pi r is pi r squared. Uh, but more important is that this approximation for the area gets better as DC gets smaller. Uh, an interesting thing, by the way, is that this value is exact. This is exactly how many uh, sectors there are, right? Uh, but this is actually an approximation that gets better as DC gets smaller. And uh, using this sum of many tiny areas to find a larger area is an example of integration. Uh, this is something that we will cover, again, very extensively in our course. And uh, integration is just the sum of many tiny areas, like the small sectors or triangles here that we used, to find the larger area of a circle. So this is the second major pillar of calculus. All right. Uh, anyone have any questions about this problem? Uh, again, we will get much more in depth to this later. This is just meant to get your feet wet, but uh, this is very, very important to understand why we even need this concept of integration. So anyone have any questions? Um, how come it's called der derivative? Uh, actually, I don't know. Uh, I will have to look into that why it's called derivative. Probably some sort of Latin root, uh, but I'm not an expert in that. But yeah. Um, so any other questions? Also, could you explain the width of the parallelogram on the last slide? Uh, yep, just one second, I will go back. Anyway, minimize this. All right, so this, uh, yeah, so the width, uh, do you mean like this width, the height? Uh the the left to right one. Oh, uh, pi r. Uh, this is just because it's half of our circumference. The total circumference is two pi r, and then pi r is just half of that. Uh, because exactly half of these sectors are on the top, and then the other half are on the bottom. Okay. Cool. That clear? Okay. Good question, by the way. Um. All right. So, if no one has any other questions, we will discuss how this can be applied. Well, clearly integration can be applied in finding area. It can also be applied in finding volume. And we'll get into that a lot uh, as our course moves on. Also an interesting application that we actually, I don't think we will have time to cover in this course, but it's the length of a function. Uh, so like if you wanted, if you had like a graph of a parabola or something like this, and you wanted to find the length of the parabola from here to here, right? then you would actually use an integral for that. Uh, and again, we will discuss what an integral even is uh, later, but an integral is just a tool that mathematicians use to integrate stuff. Then in statistics, this is used. Uh, there's this thing in statistics called a cumulative distribution function, uh, just an example of how this is used in higher level math in general. Uh, and you need an integral for that. You need integration for that. And then again, like derivatives, all of higher level math uses integrals and in general calculus. All right, so these are our two sort of main pillars of calculus, differentiation and integration. They're actually related, which is really one of the most surprising facts about calculus. And again, we will get into this relationship between them at the um, sort of the middle of our uh, course. All right, so now we will move to a fun problem. So we have Farmer Grant here, and Farmer Grant has a goat. And uh, he also has this sort of pen, this uh, rectangular uh, pen that uh, the goat has area to graze in. And so the central question that Grant wants to answer is with only 100 feet of fencing, what shape should the pen be to let the goat roam as much as possible? All right. 
uh, it has to be a rectangle, though. Uh, and again, if you want to answer this, please answer me to me in private so that other people can answer without getting the spoiler, in case your answer is correct. So I just wanted you to uh, think about this a bit. Uh, what do you think the shape of the pen, uh, like what, what should be the dimensions of the rectangle to let the goat grade as much as possible? And by room as much as possible, we mean area. Uh, so the 100 feet of fencing means the total perimeter is 100. All right. All right, I'm getting some answers. So far, they are all correct. Uh, just giving, I just want to give other people a chance to answer this. All right, so far all the answers are correct. Uh, this is very nice. Like by dimensions, I mean how many feet by how many feet? Like what's the length and what's the width? So a circle is not the correct answer because it has to be a rectangle. All right, so uh, I will now go over the solution. Uh, so the answer is 25 feet by 25 feet. That is the uh, dimensions of the rectangle that yield the optimal uh, grazing area. Uh, but now we will go over why this is the case. So uh, let's call this width of the rectangle right here x. X is just some sort of variable. It ranges from uh, 0 to 50, right? Uh, 0 to, sorry, 25, 0 to 25. Um, no, sorry, 0 to 50. <laughs> I had a brain fart right there. Uh, so yeah, so X ranges from 0 to 50. is some sort of variable. And the length right here is 50 minus X. Uh, 50 minus X because uh, if we sum the twice the width and twice the length, right? To get the perimeter, we should get 100. And so uh, two times X plus two times 50 minus X is two X plus 100 minus two X, which turns out to be 100. So everyone good about how we obtain the dimensions of this rectangle? Again, this is just in terms of a variable X. We have to figure out what X yields the maximum area. And everyone uh, good with how I got these expressions? for the length and width. All right, wonderful. Uh, in that case, I will uh, want to explain how we get uh, the area. So the area is length times width, right? Given the perimeter of 100 and a width of x, the length has to be 50 minus x. Um, so area is length times width, x times 50 minus x. And if we expand this, we get negative x squared plus 50x, right? Uh, and this actually is a quadratic. Uh, basically, the maximum point, again, we know it's a maximum because um, if we think about the shape of this parabola, uh, because the coefficient of the x squared is negative, right, 
uh, the parabola faces down, so there will be a maximum point and not a uh, minimum point like this. That's how we know there is a maximum area. And to find the maximum area, right, if we consider like this sort of uh, graph of the parabola, uh, this x that maximizes the area, right, if this is x and this is a of x, the x that maximizes the area lies smack in the middle between the two roots, right? It, it lies on this line of symmetry. And uh, the two roots are 0 and 50. Right in the middle of that is 25. So x has to be 25 to yield the maximum area. And in that case, uh, what is the area, by the way? OK, how was it determined that the bottom is 50 minus x again? Uh, well, we have to have x. If this is like the width, right, or, or the length, this is the length, and this is x. And x plus the length times 2 has to be 100, right, because the perimeter is 100. So x plus l is 50. And so subtracting l from both sides yields uh, l equals 50 minus x. So this has to be 50 minus x right here. Does that answer your question? Or All right, wonderful. Uh, so is it OK if I clear all drawings? Anyone? All right. Uh, if we were allowed to use a circle, though, uh, which one? Oh, that's actually an interesting question. So uh, let's actually look at that. Uh, so uh, there is this question about um, if we were to use if uh, the pen would be a circle and if the circumference of the circle had to be 100, uh, would that be better? So let's actually solve this problem. So if the circumference of the circle is uh, is 100, right? Because that's how the density he has. Then this is 2 pi times whatever the radius of the circle is. And the area is pi r squared, right? So the radius from here, right? The radius would be 50 over pi, just dividing the 2 pi out. And we get that the area, right? Area equals pi times 50 over pi squared, which is 2,500 over pi. And 2,500 over pi, I'm actually pretty sure that is more than, oh, by the way, uh, if it's a rectangle, the area is just 25 times 25, which is 625. Yeah, so if it's a square, right? And I'm pretty sure actually that a circle does actually yield a better area amount. So yeah, I think I think the area if we have a circle is bigger. For some reason though, uh Grant decided to do it in a rectangle. So he will have to stick with his 625. Uh yeah. So he has to uh get uh stick with his 625 uh square uh feet, I think, right? It was where the units. But anyway, that's a good question. So the circle the circular pen would actually have more area. But uh, in this case, it's a rectangle. So uh, basically, we solved this pretty easily, right? We didn't need any calculus to solve this. But where this would actually need calculus, if you remember one of the applications of calculus and of derivatives, was finding maximum and minimum points. Uh, to find the maximum point, if this function wasn't a quadratic, if it was some sort of weird uh, function, right, like a cubic or a sinusoid or something like that, like a sine wave, uh, this would require calculus. And uh, like, for example, if Grant also has to minimize money, that also requires calculus. In general, this problem just shows uh, if we have a much more you know, um, complicated area function, how useful calculus can be in uh, real life. So, okay. So uh, now we will move on to our recap. Uh, so to recap, calculus is just uh, the study of tiny changes, tiny quantities, and uh, a tiny change in an output divided by the tiny change in an input is the slope of our instantaneous or tangent line, right? Our instantaneous rate of change. The instantaneous rate of change is the slope of the tangent line. Uh, 
And this is called a derivative of the output with respect to the input. Again, we will get into this terminology in much more detail in, uh, in the later parts of the course. All right, and then uh, integration is the second major topic covered in calculus. And, uh, integration is the sum of many tiny areas to find a larger area. That's just one example of how integration can be used. Integration has actually a lot of other uh, very, very useful applications, and we will get to all of those later in the course. All right, and uh, again, tiny changes is really the essence of calculus, whether it's like tiny changes in uh, input or in like the independent variable or tiny changes in area or width or length or whatever that usually requires calculus and um, it's actually a very very useful and fun branch of math all right so it's 605 in that case i will stop sharing uh does anyone have any questions about uh the course so far uh any like concerns questions etc uh, again, if you have any questions, if they pop up at any time, feel free to email me. Uh, this recording will be posted on the Google Classroom. I will also send it to Alphademic, and hopefully they will also post it on their YouTube channel shortly. And yeah, very, very nice seeing everyone uh, today. Our next class is tomorrow, and then we will go up until Friday. So basically, it's just Monday through Friday, same time. Uh, and if you miss a class, there's always the recording. Uh, if and also the slideshow for today will also be posted on Classroom. All right, so thank you so much again for coming and uh, see you tomorrow for our next class. All right, I will stop the recording.